Hi, Will. Hi, Sarah. Oh my gosh, it's getting to see your faces so much. <laughs> Love it. Welcome, everyone. Hey, everyone. Hey, Welcome to class. <laughs> Welcome to class. That is right. Welcome to class. <laughs> Mason, how are you? Good to see you. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice. Now, Will from Japan. We're scanning the globe. We got Japan. We got, uh, well, everyone can put, if you want, put your country in the ferry. Good to see you. Put your country next to your name, just so we know where everyone's uh, dialing in from. I know it's not that feeling for everybody, but the phrase welcome to class is just so appealing right now. Right? It's just so nice. You guys, Yasmin and Todd and I, as we were preparing for the event, we were just talking about like lifelong learning and where are the classes for all the university students that have graduated available from cool professionals like Todd? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Marion. Hi, Christina again. <laughs> it looks like you're from a fantasy book. Oh. I like your background a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so feel free to end my, we're just gonna wait, like we're gonna give like three minutes and Yasmin's gonna watch the registration list, the attendees list, but feel free to un unmute and chat. We'll get started right at like 3.03, 3.05. Um, who here knows Todd through, oh, question? I was just saying, I'm loving the tune. Uh -huh. That's Todd. <laughs> I DJ, I do it oh. all. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, feel free to put in the chat box if you like where you're from. It's, I, we're really global today. I mean, Amsterdam. Uh, Perry, what time is it in Amsterdam right now? Oh my God, it's after midnight. It's already the second day. It's April 2nd for me. Yay. That is dedication. Will, what time is it? What day is it? You're in, you're, it's May there. It's May in Japan, right? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> We're not that, that the, the time difference isn't that big. It's April 2nd okay. and uh, it is what 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Well, this is literally a global workshop officially right now. Yeah. So that's great. So Which is so it, cool. Are you back to face-to-face -to -face classes again or are you still teaching online or what? We're still on that? Zoom. With Joanne, Joanne's my NYU colleague. Joanne, you're still on Zoom, right? I'm still on Zoom. I'm Zooming in today from Jersey City. I don't think it's a country, but um, sometimes it feels like a country. Well, to New Yorkers, Jersey is sometimes feels like another country. So I know, but I, I actually still think I live in New York. You're right? still a New Yorker. You're still one of us. Right. I, that's exactly right. If I could, if I could walk across the river, it would be it would be quicker than taking the path train. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think we're supposed to be back in person in the fall, according if everything goes according to plan. So we'll see. We're doing it a hybrid. Way, so we're, we're face to face, but also zooming from the classroom. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everyone's everyone's in hybrid mode, uh, or will be at work. And are we gonna get started in just a minute or so? Mm -hmm. Johnny, good to see you. Welcome. A lot of friends here. This is like uh, my bar mitzvah. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> People I know from all all aspects of my life and from all over the world. So. I isn't that, yeah I love that that's a, isn't that how it should be? Yeah. <laughs> teach your community, teach your community, teach your community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah, Yasmin, how many did we have on the list, and how many do we have on the room? Like, oh. Sorry, we have more in the room than we had on the list. Ah, yeah, right. that's a, it's usually the other go. way around. That's amazing. That's that's actually yeah. yeah you guys, we just like it, it's usually a fifty percent show up rate is typical in online settings, but not that's maybe it's so close. It's Todd, yeah. not Todd. Yeah, you very rarely get more than the sign up. That is a rarity. So that's great. awesome celebration. And Pat, nice to meet you. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I guess Chad, do you want to get started? I yeah, let's get started. Kick us off. Here. Kick us off, Maxine. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to um, Todd Church's Passion Skills Matrix paid workshop hosted by Pick My Brain. Um, we kind of uh, collaborated. Um, uh, Todd is a university educator, uh, executive coach, uh, author, has so many classes in his backpack 
to offer the world. And so when I met Todd, I was like, okay, uh, can we unpack some of those classes? Because what, at, what we do at Pick My Brain is we want to share as much knowledge as possible with the world in all these different ways. We do it one to one and one to many. And a lot of you guys probably came through this portal through a Pick My Brain door, either Todd's page, which expressed what he has to offer, um, or Pick My Brain's page, which again, we're just starting to offer these classes. Um, and, and so we're gathering today for 90 minutes um, straight, like a class. And I was telling Yasmin and Todd before I joined, I was just so excited that I got my notebook and my coffee mug and what a pleasure it is to be taught um, by someone such as Todd. So anyways, I'm really excited to have you here. And I think that's all I'm gonna say. And I'm just gonna let Todd dig in because we've got um, 90 minutes to build a passion skills matrix that I hope all of us can use to guide us in some decisions that are really important at this time in this economy. So I'm really excited to learn with you all. Todd, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Maxine. I always say that the true value of knowledge is not in its accumulation, but in its application. This is all about application today. This is not hypothetical, academic, or theoretical. The Passion Skill Matrix is a model I teach. It's in my book. I teach them both my NYU and, and Columbia graduate classes. It's probably the most important coaching tool in my executive coaching toolkit. In fact, I was just using it with a client today. So hopefully you'll be able to add this to your toolkit. Also, I didn't have my full gallery view open. So I only saw two rows. I didn't see welcome Benno and, and Denise and, and people who, uh, who just popped in. So thanks for being here. And, and we'll all get a chance to meet each other over the course of this session. We're not gonna go around the room and say, tell us about yourself. We're gonna weave that in seamlessly throughout the workshop. So um, today's session is all about I, did, I almost said tonight's session, but you can't even go by time, right? It's first thing in the morning in Japan for Will, right? So this session is all about looking in the mirror. So this is about self-reflection. It's about self-awareness and it's about self-improvement. So everything that we're talking about today is for the purpose of gaining some insights into who we are and how we are. Uh, and, and also in terms of what we could do differently so we could do it even better going forward. So, um, just a little bit about myself, just real briefly for those who may not know me. My company is called Big Blue Gumball. We do management and leadership consulting, training, and coaching here in New York City, and um, specializing in any area related to soft skills, so presentation skills, management, leadership. Additionally, I teach at both, um, oh, first, Big Blue Gumball, in case you're wondering about the name of the company, it represents the world or the globe. It's a metaphor. The world is like a big blue gumball to us. Um, and our mission is to make the world a better place one leader at a time. And to us, everyone is a leader. It doesn't matter what you do. And if you're just leading yourself in your own life, you are a leader. So additionally, I teach leadership at NYU in the HR master's program uh, with Joanne Tombrekos, uh, my colleague is here. I also teach leadership in a number of programs at Columbia, including their MFA theater program. I teach leadership for Broadway stage managers, which is an interesting take on leadership. I get to use a lot of my Shakespeare background and incorporate some show tunes, et cetera. So again, it's all about our audiences. It's also about, it's all about leveraging our skills and sharing our passions. And that's what one of the themes is for today. Some of you may know I did a TEDx talk a couple of years ago on the, um, the power of visual thinking. So everything I do is around using visualization, visual thinking, and we'll talk more about that today. And my book, Visual Leadership, was just published last year by Simon & Schuster. Um, and I actually just sold my 1,000th copy last week, which is a huge milestone for me. So for a first-time author who's not Dan Pink or Seth Godin, um, so that was a nice, uh, a nice milestone. So that was, that was kind of cool. So what is visual leadership? Just for those who may not know, basically it's about the application of visual thinking to the practice of leadership. So it's leading by thinking visually. So it's about thinking in pictures. And that's what we're gonna do a lot of today is visualizing ourselves, visualizing our past, visualizing our futures, and then sharing our visions with each other in a couple of conversations, group discussions, breakout sessions, so that we can get people to see what we're saying. And that's one of my catchphrases is, how do you get people to see what you're saying? How do you get an idea out of your head and into someone else's? So if you think about your passions and your skills, if you're on a job interview or you're talking to a client, you need to get them to see your skills. You need to get them to see your potential. And you also need to get let your passion sh sh shine through, right? You need to, what, I hadn't thought about this in years, but one time I was on a job interview and I heard my back playing softball. So I was slumping down in my chair. So I was sitting like this and I was talking, I was telling the guy how interested I was in this job. And he was like, can I get you an ottoman? It looks like you're laying down. Do you not, do you want to sit on the couch? He didn't realize, I was trying to alleviate my back pain, but 
my passion did not, he, he said, it sounds like you're not really that interested in this job. I said, no, I am. Why do you say that? He's like, well, look at your body language. And I, that didn't even occur to me. Here I was just trying to avoid being in excruciating pain, but he took my reclining nature as a lack of passion. So um, when we're passionate about something, it should come through, it should shine through. And as you can tell, because well, I talk loud and fast, so I'm from New York anyway, but when I'm passionate about something, I talk even louder and even faster. So we're gonna cover a lot in just 90 minutes tonight. So including the use of, when we talk about visual thinking and visual communication, there's a lot of different ways, including the use of visual imagery, pictures and drawing. So we're actually gonna be doing some drawing tonight. So hopefully you have a pad and pen with you. Visual imagery is about pictures. Mental models and frameworks, how do you put something in a box? We always talk about thinking outside the box, but in order to think outside the box, we have to have something inside the box. And the, with the passion skill matrix, we're gonna put the complexity of your life into a box so you can see it more clearly and discover your potential and make some decisions about where you should be spending your time. Metaphors are about comparing one thing to something else. We'll talk a little bit about that. And storytelling, a big part of um, communicating is sharing our stories with other people. So as you think about what you're passionate about and think about what you're skills, skilled in, what are the stories that go along with that, right? Whether you're on a job interview or talking to someone else, what are the stories that tell that illustrate um, the passions that you have and the skills that you possess? So tonight's session is focused specifically on mental models and most specifically on one mental model, the passion skill matrix. The passion skill matrix is a model I developed over years and I fine tuned it to the point where this is the model that I use. So it may be a little fuzzy right now, but all will be made clear by the end of this session. So again, uh, I meant uh, the passion skill matrix is in chapter 17 of my book. Some of you have it, but even if you don't, um, my gift to you tonight is if you go to toddchurches.com slash passion, you could download this chapter for free. So don't do it now. But I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll be sending you, Yasmin will be sending you a copy, a PDF copy of the slides from tonight. So don't worry if you need to write everything down. And then when you get the slides, if you just click on this slide, it'll take you right to the link and you just download the chapter and uh, you can play around with it. And, and you'll always have a memory of all the key points of this model and of tonight. So with that, let, I just figured out how to do that. So let's go back. Let's do that one more time. Uh, with that, let's turn the page and let's get started. So this is where the interactivity starts. So um, this is about looking in the mirror and looking in the mirror is not always easy. Um, first of all, let's, uh, we have so few of us tonight. It's not like we have 50 or hundred people. So you're welcome to turn on your mics. It's great that everyone has your cameras on. And if you don't, you're welcome to turn them on. But uh, what does this picture represent to you? So now let's, let's make this a conversation. What's going on in this picture as it relates to tonight? What would you say? Who's going to kick us off? This this looks like the fun room at the at an amusement park. <laughs> it is the fun room. And what else can we tell? And how does it relate to uh, to tonight, Joanne? What would you say? Well, to me, it's you know all the different <laughs> the one all the way to the right. Um, I don't know what, if it's your right. Looks like me during the pandemic, but I'm kind of <laughs> getting over to the other side now that I'm losing my pandemic pounds. So yeah, it's kind of stretching and moving in the different aspects of of who I might be. Okay, great. Thank you. Someone else? Again, it could mean different things. It should mean different things to different people. So what are some of the messages here when you're putting on your visual thinking hat? How can you take this and what is this? How does this relate to tonight? I think it's just seeing, seeing yourself in a different lens from a different lens and um, in different roles and, and, um, and, and looking at and then especially after we apply the skills from the chapter, we may be looking at ourselves completely differently uh, at the end of the exercise. Great, thank you, Denise. Denise is a big fan of my book, so thank you for being here, Denise. We met at uh, Aisha Bursell's Design the Life You Love uh, weekly workshop, which is every Wednesday at five Eastern, and Indrani as well. Nice to have you here as well. Um, so building on what Denise said, what else would you add to that? It's all about perspective. So like, depending on how you're looking at something, it's gonna look differently. Great perspective, thank you, Marion. What else? Let's get a Kids couple more. Love the distortion effect, you oh, know. They, they want to, yeah, look at this. Look at me. You know, more, more than adults, they we want to try to get our best image. You know, our best self. All with all. Yeah, the we want to. Thanks, Will. Yeah, we want to bring our best self. And the word distortion, right? When we look in the mirror, what we see may not always be what other people see, or what even what we see is it accurate, right? How do you gauge whether or not you're it's an accurate reflection? So we're talking about literally looking in the mirror, but also metaphorically looking in the mirror in terms of our passions, our skills. Um, does the world see what we see? Do we see ourselves accurately? What's the benefit 
you know, I, I mentioned before tonight's about self-awareness, self-reflection, self-improvement. Um, what's the value and the power of having an accurate self-reflection? I guess one of the things for me is um, it, um, there's a message in here about not be, about an inability or difficulty conveying uh, who you are to other people or, or um, your passion. Great. And what's the downside of not being able to do that, James? Uh, well, you, I don't know, you get stuck in a rut or, um, you know, you can't, uh, lack of fulfillment. Okay, great, great, thank you. Someone else, what else? What else does this, what, what, what else does this bubble up to the surface for you? These are all kinds of different voices I have in my head, Todd. Mm. So, well, you know, all kinds of different personalities and depending on who I want to be, this is who I can portray. Great, great. Yeah, so we're, we're multiple selves. Uh, Maxine and I were just on a workshop today with a group of quote, multi-potentialites or it's called the octopus movement. And picture an octopus, octopus with eight arms and Perry, you could, you could explain it. Uh, why don't you explain it? Just take 30 seconds, explain to us what the octopus and multi-potentialite movement is about and how it relates to this. We're multi-potentialites. We're amazing people that are um, multiple brain connections. We're different than the rest. We're, we don't fit in a box. We have labels. We have ADHD, ADD, bipolar, dyspraxia, dyslectic. And, and we always have been outside of the box. And people said, oh, no, you're not specialists, so we don't want to work with you. But actually, we have superpowers and we're amazing people and we can do even more than specialists and we can connect even more dots. So for me, this picture is maybe how I feel. Sometimes I feel small, sometimes I feel super tall and sometimes I feel like fat and, and all. Um, yeah, that's how it looks for me. And, and why do you tell us why the octopus? Why the octopus is the metaphor for and the, and the mascot? That, for... That's a that's a good question. I was in Clubhouse and talking to multipotentialites, and I said, "Oh, it's so linear to think about multipotentialites, polymath scanners, jack of all trades." I want a symbol that that we all can find each other in, and and that that feels good. And then someone said, "I always send." the octopus emoji when I talk to someone just for the fun of it, just because it feels good to me. And then everybody's like, yeah, the octopus. And then someone said, there's the octopus teacher on Netflix, which is an amazing documentary. Yeah. And then I said, after interviewing amazing people like you, Todd, in a year time, and I said, okay, that's it. It's the octopus movement. Now we're doing it. That's great. Thank you, Perry. Yeah, so just like an octopus has eight arms, it has its all its arms in different in different areas. Similarly, we all do, right? Some of us are running our own business and teaching and writing and we're on Clubhouse and we have our social media presence to manage or we'll read us teaching people how to do um, you know, how to walk, you know, how to, how to walk, how to do martial arts and calligraphy, right? We're all leveraging our various talents. And similarly, we look in the mirror. It's like, which self are we today? Right, which self are we waking up as? What are we bringing to the table? And also, how do people see us? And Maxine and I were just talking about that. How can someone refer you for something if you, you, if you can't clearly define you know, who you are and what you do? Michael Roderick, uh, who runs the Gate Group on Facebook, he always talks about your referable, your referable brand. What do you want to be referred to as? How could someone recommend you if they can't clearly articulate on your behalf what it is that you do? And they can't do that if you're not clear, right? So a big part of today is to gain some clarity in terms of what you're skilled at, what you're passionate about, so that you could articulate that to others so that they can articulate that on your behalf. And through that, we can grow our businesses, build our relationships, build our networks. That's a big part of what today is all about. So let me just go back to this for one second. So what we wanna do is smash the mirror and reinvent ourselves starting today. Let's, let's take a fresh look with a fresh lens, visual thinking. Let's look at ourselves from a new lens. Um, in my TEDx talk, I end with the line from Marcel Proust that the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. By the end of tonight, hopefully everyone here will be looking at yourself through a new lens and with fresh eyes. What is this last image before we move forward into mm -hmm. the model itself? What is this? Many of us have seen this meme many times, but have you really thought about it? What are a variety of ways of interpreting this? What's the primary one, the basic one that most people jump to is what? Being fierce. Being and fierce. In what way, Sarah? 
Um, you know, you see like this small, cute little cuddly kitten that's very vulnerable. But when it looks in the mirror, it sees the potential that that uh, cat has inside of it. Great. Yeah. So living inside that kitten is a lion, right? It's aspirational. Yeah. It's looking at yourself and like, this is a world of possibilities. This is who I could be. What's the dangerous side? What's another way of looking at this? Overconfidence. Yeah. In what way, Maxine? In what way? Um, uh, seeing something that you might become but aren't yet and believing that's where you're at, which can actually cause harm, you know, to yourself if you uh, go out with that and it's not accurate. Yeah. Exactly right. So Maxine hit on the head a couple of things. First of all, it's about the importance of having an accurate self uh, self reflection, right? If we are, we can actually get ourselves in a lot of trouble if we overestimate. What if you took on a client or a project that was too big for you? Because that maybe someday um, it would, you would be the perfect fit for it, but maybe right, not right now, you can end up shooting yourself in the foot, right? So on one hand, you want to be aspirational. You want to see yourself and your potential. The flip side is the danger of having an inaccurate self-impression that could get you into trouble. And Maxine used the magic word, yet. Yeah. Um, if you've read any work, uh, any of the work by, um, I, I've actually been talking about yet for like 20 years, but Carol Dweck put it on the map. So you have to give her credit. Carol Dweck wrote the book called Mindset and talked about the difference between having a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Someone with a fixed mindset so them, says, I'm good at this or I'm not good at this. Someone with a growth mindset says, I'm not good at this yet. Or I'm good at this, but I'm not great at it yet. I'm not number one, I'm not a master of it yet. The word yet opens up the world of possibilities. So we're going to talk a lot tonight about growth and development and how we can maximize our potential. So just keep in mind this image. You want to be the lion, but see how big a lion you are um, in reality. And, and that will help you make decisions, better decisions in terms of what you take on at this point um, in your life and where you are. So with that, I'd like what I'd like to do right now is give some thought. Now we're going to do some personal reflection. So you're going to be looking in the mirror, right? Um, I'd like you to take out some, a piece of paper um, and just think about your answer to this question. At work and in life, what are the main things that you feel that you are good at, not good at, most enjoying, and least enjoy doing? Um, hopefully everyone will be able to share with each other tonight. But the first thing I want to do is just ask you this question before you write anything down. What's your first reaction? If someone says to you, um, you know, Christina, what are you good at? You know, what, how would you respond? What's, what, respond? What's your immediate, intuitive, instinctual response to that? So in the chat box, answer the question, hey, you know, Sarah or Pat or Beno, what are you good at? Just, you know, without, you're not bragging. This is not bragging today. This is just being honest, right? Someone once said, it's not bragging if it's true, right? So pick one thing that you would put in the, as the, an answer to the question, what are you good at? And let's see what people say. Listening, organizing, making people happy, listening. A lot of good listeners here. People, writing, kindness, I'm going backwards, storytelling, synthesizing info, navigating relationships, connecting with people. Great. It's always great to see what people are putting here. Logically mapping out and solving problems, great. Listening and be, uh, bringing people together. Questioning, Japanese language and culture, building supplier relationships, storytelling. You know, it's interesting. I know so many people here are just before looking at their name, I just look at what they wrote and I guess who it was like for Denise and, and Will. So um, again, part of establishing your brand is if, so let's say someone comes to me and says, I need someone who's an expert in Japanese language and culture. Who do you know? Who am I gonna call? Will is the first one that's gonna to come to my mind, right? So this is about personal branding. This is about that referable brand I, 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 I talked about before. This is the magic question I always pose for people. What do you wanna be known as the guru of and the go-to person for, right? So for me, I'm, I've been working on this for years. So it's like if someone says, if you need a business book, call Todd. Todd's read, I've read an average of one business, although you may call Denise. I think Denise is the only one I know who's read more books than I have. So um, I've been reading an average of one business book a week since 1998. That's 50, that's, uh, 50 a year for 22 years. That's over 1,100 business books. Denise, and last year I read about um, around 60. 
Uh, Denise, tell everyone or put in the chat box how many books you read last year. Um, I read 292 books last year. How amazing is that? And now, Denise, put, tell everyone what your favorite book. No, I'm not going to make you do that. No, my favorite book is Visual Leadership. It's very easy to say. <laughs> <laughs> because like Will, like Will, I lived in Japan. I also lived in China. And I would, if I had that book back then, it would have solved a lot of problems for me in doing things more visually. Um, and I'm sure Will understands as well. Um, especially kanji, right? It, it covers everything. Yeah, th th thank you. First of all, that's very kind, Denise. I, that was a setup. I, Denise, I, thank you for saying that. But yeah, like, for example, if you, so if you want someone who knows about books, if you want to know for, you talk to someone who's lived in Japan, it might be Will. You want to know someone who talked to someone who's lived in many countries, including Japan and China, then Denise is my person, right? So it's like, you have to know what people, one, one of the chapters of my book is called, it's better, it's more important to be interested than interesting. Um, and that's not original. Dale Carnegie said that back in like 1936 when he wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People. What is it about you that makes you interesting is important, but also being interest, genuinely interested in other people is how we learn what people's passions are, what their skills are, what they're good at, and then who you could refer. Um, one, one of my uh, things that I've been talking about is my, my three Gs, be genuine, be generous, and be grateful. Um, when you connect with someone, whether it's in a chat, uh, clubhouse or, or Zoom or whatever, try to connect with people to learn about them. And in the course of it, they'll learn about you. But if you start with the approach of how can I help this person? What can I learn about this person that will help me to help them? And hopefully what goes around comes around and people re will reciprocate out of generosity. It doesn't always happen. But if you start with that approach, it's a great, first of all, it's just the nice thing to do. It's a kind thing to do. But also you never know what you may learn um, who you may meet and the relationships you may develop. So many of people here, in fact, I think everyone on this call who I know I've met over the last year. There's not one person who I knew before the pandemic and before Zoom, right? And think about Mason, his book is coming out. When's your book coming out, Mason? I'm sorry, it's due April 12th. It's up uh, on pre-order now on Amazon. Great, and tell everyone the title. Uh, it's The Chutzpah Advantage. Who knows what chutzpah is? <laughs> Some people do, you will after you read uh, Mason's book. But Mason reached out to me and he asked me, and I wrote the forward for his book. And I was very honored and proud. A number of people have asked me to endorse their books, but to write the forward for someone's book was a tremendous honor. So thank you for that, Mason. Well, your, book, your book, Visual Leadership, uh, has a lot of impact. Thank so you. I thought you were appropriate. And then also being a, a fellow New Yorker uh, with a similar accent to mine, huh. it was easy. Yeah. to uh, see you writing in a style similar to mine, engaging, funny, good stories. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, so speaking the same language means a lot of things in a lot of different ways. But Can um, I interrupt for one second, Todd? Sure, go ahead and try. Okay, I just had a clarification question because you're such a fantastic speed talker <laughs> that I wanted to interrupt for a moment to ask the three Geez, because I'm taking notes at the same time. Genuine, grateful, and that the, what was the third? In, in order, be, in my book, I talk about be genuine and be generous. Oh, generous, uh, generous. That's the and one then, I but the third one that I added because I just met the author uh, Chester Elton, who wrote the book uh, Leading with Gratitude. And there's so many people. Gratitude. Chris Palmore, um, Chris Shembra. Um, I've met so many people this year who are all about being grateful and having gratitude. That I I always had the two G's of be genuine and be and generous but right. i had to be grateful just because gratitude is such an important thing and it's so um and it relates to everything that we do just being looking at things in a positive way and appreciating what people bring to the table um, i like the addition thank you thank you and i added act with grace as well but that became for john baldoni wrote this book grace which is right behind me and it's mm -hmm. about how leaders can exhibit grace but I like the rule of three, so I try to limit things to three. But if I was going to add a fourth, it would be mm -hmm. exhibit grace. That would be my fourth one. So what I'm going to do right now is let's get back to this list. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you three minutes uh, solo time. So this is where we're going to start getting more interactive yeah. and you can start building your matrix. So step one of building the matrix is if you would create a chart like this um, and then just fill in the blanks. Try to write at least three things under each heading. So what, and there might be some good, there might be some overlap, right? Or there might not be. So just answer the questions. I am good or great at one, two, three. I am not good at one, two, three. I like or love to do one, two, three. And I don't like to do one, two, three. And this is at work or in life. So I'm actually gonna be quiet. I'm gonna set the timer 
usually if I don't set the timer, I give people 30 seconds and it's like, hey, that was not enough time. So I'm gonna give you three minutes and this is gonna be the foundation of your matrix. So it's important that you capture, fill in all these boxes. So three minutes on the clock starting now and go. Okay, you have one more minute. If you only have two or one, it doesn't, that's okay too. But if you can get three in each column, in each uh, category, that would be great. And you have till the end of this song. Nice homage to Alex Trebek. <laughs> Okay, you have to tell us how many dollars, you, how much you're bidding on your, no, we're not doing that. What we're gonna do right now is, here's mine. Here's an example of, and, and this will change all the time. Like for me, the things I'm good or great at, writing blog posts, coaching, public speaking, uh, not good at technology, financial stuff, sales. Uh, I like or love to read. If I could, I would just lock myself away and read as much as possible. I love teaching. I love designing training programs. I don't like to write proposals, negotiate contracts, or do paperwork. So these are all things that are on my to-do list all the time. These are part of my job and my life. You may have some of the same ones. Um, there's some overlap between things I'm good or great at and I like to do or vice versa. Um, is it possible to be good at something you don't like to do? Is it, good, is it possible to not like doing something that you're good or great at? Right. So let's start. Th we're gonna start thinking about that. Uh, next thing I'd like you to do is this: score yourself. Uh, and this is tricky. It's not easy to do, and it doesn't have to be accurate to the exact number. But score yourself on a scale of one to ten in each area. So I gave you just four samples, right? So on the good or great, good to great should be like five or like six to ten. Um, if it's not good or you don't like it, it should be like zero or one up to five. So um, if it's a tie, you know, just again, it's not scientific, it doesn't have to be scientifically accurate, but just in general, um, it just gives you a chance to kind of look at things relatively, like other things you're good at great at is what's a nine versus an eight versus a 10. So uh, just take a few seconds and score yourself 
um, on each of the items that you listed. So that's it now for how good we are at, not like how much we like it, right? Uh, if it's in the good category, it's how good or great you are. And then the like, it's how much you like it or, don't, or, or okay. don't like it. So just, again, just read straight across and just whatever comes to you first is usually the best answer. And again, you can always change it later. You can always say, I changed my mind. You're not locked into anything. But this is just a, a lot of people like to quantify things on um, this qualitative metrics and quantitative. And it just helps in this model if you could put a number to something just because it gives you kind of a relative scale um, with the things that you put down. And what I find is you often, as you're doing your matrix, you often will fine tune things and that's totally fine. As long as you're within a, you know, a number or one or two off is totally fine. It just needs to uh, um, be a starting point. Can we order, can we have two fives or just one five? No, you can have, a, you, you, five, you could do it. You can have multiple numbers for the same. Like you may both, you might fine tune or tweak things later, but for right now, if that's the number, that's the number and that's totally fine. Yeah, okay. yeah we're not rank ordering right now. We're just kind of, you know. And some people feel uncomfortable saying I'm a 10 at something, but if you really feel you are, then give yourself a 10. This is just for yourself. You're not sharing it with anyone. So, um, you know, be bold, be, uh, be candid. And if you're a one at something, say I'm a one. Or if you hate something, say it's a zero. Um, you get the most value out of, it, uh, out of this, the more honest you are and the more candid you are. So take another 30 seconds. You can always, again, fine tune it as we go along. And now we're gonna start to enter the matrix. So just before we do, when we talk about passion and skills, the way we're gonna talk about this is the top two categories are your skills, right? You're good at something. You're, it goes from like, I suck at it to I'm amazing at it. And from I hate it to I love it, right? So these are your skills. These are your passions. And again, there might be, and I'm sure there will be some overlap as we start to look at things and say, I'm good at this, but do I like it or not like it? I'm not good at this, but maybe it's something that even though I'm not that great yet, I actually enjoy it, or it's something I have an interest in or a passion for. So now I'm gonna introduce you to the passion skill matrix model. So first step is on a separate piece of paper, give yourself some room to write in the box and around the box. So I always recommend using a separate piece of paper for this. And again, this is a, just to hit the pause button metaphor and pull back the curtain, another metaphor. This is an exercise in visual thinking, right? We're taking ideas and we said in order to think outside the box, you need to have stuff in the box. We're now gonna put stuff in the box so you could see it more clearly and have, get some insights and ahas that maybe you hadn't had before. So step one is to draw a simple four quadrant matrix and then um, label it as follows. So along the left axis, it goes from I don't like it to I like it and across the bottom from I'm not good at it to I'm good at it. So basically this is passions along the left margin and skills along the bottom. So step one is just to get caught up with this. And then if to quantify things, you can add, and you don't have to do it this fancy with the boxes within the boxes. You can use a simple four box matrix. And then you can add the numbers from zero to five to 10 along the, the side going up and down and across the bottom. So now this is all starting to come together. So now uh, I'll give you another few seconds and then we're gonna, we're gonna introduce the, the model itself. Those of you who've, uh, who've read the book will know the model, but you may not have actually done this before. So this will be a, a test of your, both your memory and your, uh, and your retention uh, and your ability to apply it. So I always talk about, I talk about in my TED talk, attention, comprehension, and retention. When you use visual language and visual thinking and visual imagery, it captures our attention and focus because we're looking at it. It increases our comprehension or our understanding because we can see it, we can wrap our brain around it. And retention, it improves our memory and recall. And again, that's the power of visual 
thinking and visual communication. So let's start with the upper right quadrant. What would you call this? And, and I'm going to ask people who've read the book if you know the answer. Let's 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 start with the people who may not or have not seen this before. Um, upper right quadrant. You're good or great at something, and you like it or you love it. What would you call this box? What would you label it? Nirvana. <laughs> Nirvana is great. It's also be a great, good name for a band. But yeah, so Nirvana could be one. What else would you call the upper right? The sweet spot. The sweet spot, exactly right. So why, Christina, why the sweet, sweet spot? Well, that's what, what you want to do, right? Because then basically that means that the things you're good at and hopefully also can make money with is the things you actually enjoy doing. So, you know. Nicely done, yes. I, I didn't have this out yet, but for in my classes, I sometimes use this when people get the right answer or when they don't. So I will occasionally, it's obnoxious, but I just figured that Christina warranted the bell ring right there. So. What, so how would you describe the sweet spot to someone? You like it or love it, and you're good or great at it. So um, before ask, asking for what you would put in that box, just in general, what does it look like? What does it feel like when you're working in the sweet spot? Like you spent your, if someone said, how was your day today? And you were like, I was in my sweet spot all day today. What does that look or feel like, Maxine? Flow. 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 <laughs> yeah, that classic book. No, I flow. agree. Called Mahal by Mahali. I can never pronounce his last name. Chick Mahali, right? Um, the book Flow. So, what do we mean when we're in a state of flow? Time. It's kind of like fulfilling your purpose. Fulfilling right. your purpose. On so time flies by. What else does it feel like? What it's, uh, it's where um, it's where your like perceived challenge and your actual capabilities match. So there's like the perfect amount of challenge and the perfect amount of skills. Great, I love that. And I was thinking as you were talking, I was picturing Maslow's hierarchy of needs in that top, you know, the self-actualization, right? It's like when who we are and what we do is in alignment. Um, we have that state of flow. Um, it's, it's the, we talk about what do you want to be known as the guru of or the go-to person for. That usually happens in your sweet spot. Time flies by, you shine, people know you as good at this or great at this, right? So that's our sweet spot. There's a sense of pride and satisfaction. And you know, that's when we're in the zone. That's the, not, that's the other phrase I couldn't think of. Like when we're in the zone, that's the sweet spot. What about the upper left? We like to do it, maybe we even love it, but we're not good or great at it yet. What, what would we call it? And how would you describe it? Who wants to take a shot at that? What would you call this box? You're, you're climbing the learning curve. Okay, you're climbing the learning curve. Great, what else? What other words or phrases would you put in this box? Struggle. Growth. Challenge. Challenge. Growing. Did someone say growth? I think I heard someone say growth. Growing, yeah. All right. Growing. So, what, so the growth zone, right? Uh, this is the box of yet, right? This is where I'm not good at it yet, or I'm not good, as great as I'd like to be yet. If you have an interest in something, if you have a passion for something, you're more likely to work at it and work towards it. And this is where you're spending time in this box. Let's go to the lower right. Uh, what would you call this? You're good or great at something, but you don't love it and you might even hate it. What would you call this box? Dead end. Dead end, why Benno? Um, because I won't be excited to do it, you know, so it won't fulfill me and I'll, I'll run out of juice really quickly. Yeah, that's great. So it's a dead end because either we are so um, good at something and we're not, we're so disengaged that we could, could sometime, sometimes go on autopilot or cruise control or procrastinate because we don't want to do it. And you think, oh, this is going to be a breeze. And then we end up not delivering, right? So there's a lot of things that can happen in this quadrant. Uh, what else? What else does this look or sound like? And what would we call this box? Boring. It's boring. Why? Well, there's no challenge. You don't like it and you're good at it. So it's it's boring. Okay, great. You can like do it in your sleep, right? And you probably will fall yeah. asleep if you're out of boredom, right? Uh, what else? What else would we call this box? Any labels or phrases? I was going to say Golden burnout. Handcuffs. Wait, hold on one second. Andrani, Andrani first? I was going to say burnout. Yeah, burnout. It's very easy to get burned out in that box. Someone said, um, who else said? Uh, uh, golden handcuffs. In what way? In what ways, James? What does that mean? Oh, well, if you're good at it, but you don't like to do it, but you need, you need the money, uh, you know, that's how you're generating your income. 
Yeah, that's definitely that definitely happened. So what would what would we call this box? But what do I call it? You can call it whatever you want. But what do I call it? Default mode. Or... Yeah, that's what I call it. I call it. I call it the default the zone, default right? Zone. Yeah, Pe yeah. People look to us to do this by default. So, for example, when I was working for my former company, uh, people say, "Oh, Todd's a good writer. Let him proofread this." Let can Todd? Can you re edit this for me? Todd, can you fix up my PowerPoint slides? Right. Just because I'm good at something doesn't necessarily mean I want to do it, or that I want to do it for you, right? If I have to do it, it's part of my job. I have to do it, right? By default because um, there's no one else to do it. But a lot of times people dump things on us because a lot of times they don't know. Sometimes they think, oh, you're so great at it and it comes so easy to you that of course, why wouldn't you love it, right? So they think, oh, it's a sweet spot. You'd be thrilled to help out. And I'm like, I have other priorities, other things to do. And you know what, I'm kind of tired of it. For me, for years, I was a project manager and I love being a project manager in the theme park business. I got to go to China. I built a theater in, uh, in LA, a motion simulation theater. And as a project manager, I was very good at it and I loved it at the time. But if, if I was offered the opportunity to do that now, I would say no way, right? It's like, that's my past. So that would be a default zone thing. I'm good at it, but that's not where I want to be spending my time and my career right now. What do you call the lower left? So you don't like it. You maybe hate it and you're not good at it, and you may be the worst person in the world at it, uh, what, what's this box called? A yeah. trap. It's a trap. <laughs> what else? Stay away zone. Say it again, Christina? Stay away zone. Stay away, definitely. What else? Avoid at all costs, as, as, uh, as Benno just said. Any other guesses what I call it? Swan. Allergy zone. Say it again? Allergy zone. Allergy, right, we're allergic to this stuff. I call it the failure zone. If you're doing zone. something, if you're doing something that you don't like and you're not good at it, you're setting yourself up for failure. Now, years ago, I took a job um, after I moved back from LA. I took a job as vice president of business development for a web design company during the boom of the dot com era. It was my highest salary ever. It was my first vice v VP title. I love the culture of the company. I love the CEO. I took the job for all the wrong reasons because it was basically a sales job, a business development job. And I plunged myself into the failure zone starting on day one. Actually, day two. Day one was great. Day two, I realized I had made a mistake, that this job was not a good fit for me. And yeah. um, you know, after 90 days, we figured out that this just isn't working out. I try to get better at it. I try, to, I try to learn to like it. But I just put myself in the failure zone, again, because I needed a job and I took it for all the wrong reasons. So. Um, so first of all, I, we have a lot to talk about here before we, we start to create your own um, passion skill matrix. So the first thing, it's obvious, we wanna spend as much time as possible in the sweet spot, but why not all of our time in the sweet spot? No growth opportunity. Exactly, yeah, if, we're, if we spend 100% of our time in the sweet spot, then we're not spending time growing. Also, in every job, there's always some default stuff. There's always some aspects of our jobs that we don't necessarily love. Um, we may be good at it. There may be even be some parts of your job where you're in the failure zone, hopefully not like a zero and a zero, maybe somewhere in the four or five range, but we all have parts of our job that maybe we're not good at that we can outsource to someone else or that we can uh, automate or systematize in some way so it's not as painful or, or as difficult. Um, so before I, we move forward, um, think about what percentage of your time, picture a, 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 an average or a normal or typical week for you, what percentage of your time would you say that you spend in each of the four quadrants? So that's the first thing, just take 100% and break it down into these four boxes just to just as a starting point, as a benchmark. And again, this is just for yourself for right now. And I just saw Sarah's comment that yes, the pandemic zone, yes, I think we're all, it's like the twilight zone. We're all in the pandemic zone. And after, you, after you've identified what percentage of time you're, you're spending right now as a benchmark, now write down the number, what percentage of your time, if you could ideally pick 
where and when and how you're spending your time? What would be your ideal realistic? We can't, in a real, in an ideal world, we would spend 100% of our time above the line in sweet spot and growth zone and zero below the line. That's not reality. So based on reality, if you were able to shift some things around and reprioritize, which hopefully tonight will help you to be able to do, what would your ideal passion skill matrix look like in terms of the percentage uh, variation from your where you are right now? So just take a like a minute just to think about where you are now in terms of the four boxes and then percentage wise, what would your ideal one be based on reality? And you'll have a chance to share this shortly in breakout sessions. You don't have to say it to the whole room, but you'll have a chance to talk about it with, with, with others. And Marga, welcome. I see that you're here. I, I hadn't noticed you before. Welcome aboard. Yes, sorry, I'm late. No worries, no worries. Better late than never. We'll get you caught up. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> All right, so now that you've done your before and after, we're just gonna keep that in mind right now. What I'd like you to do, um, first of all, let me ask you this question. Is it possible, now, now we're gonna talk, now we're gonna do a little, before you do your own passion skill matrix, let's just play around with a few ideas. Can you, is it possible to go from a failure zone to a sweet spot and have you ever done it? And do you have an example of it that you're willing to share? First of all, raise, raise your hand if you've ever gone from a failure, something that was in your failure zone, which is now a sweet spot. Okay, so who's willing to share one example? Will, why don't you go first, Will? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, my biggest nightmare was to have to perform on the stage. We didn't, it was required for an English class. So I didn't like speaking in public. Uh, now I regularly perform, uh, not perform, but present on television. Uh, I think the largest audience is 100 million people, quite comfortable on camera, and I actually love it. I was used that, to want to avoid no matter what, you know. Was that a Zoom call? No, no, uh, this is 100 million people. No, television. Okay, just checking. Just want to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> but Will, Will is a master presenter in multiple languages. Will is a Japanologist, Japanologist, who's an American who's mastered the art and uh, science and practice of Japanese culture. So you definitely, hopefully everyone will, will uh, later we'll ask everyone to put your LinkedIn or your Pick My Brain links in the uh, in the chat box so we can all stay connected. So Will, that was great. Who else had their hand up? Has an example of a failure zone? Perry. I was homeless for a year. I gave up everything and I thought, let's do a hard reset. Let's be cool and let's figure out how that works. Well, that was the failure zone, really, that I messed up everything. Mm. Um, and then I went to the default zone quite quickly, quite fast. So. Yeah, that's that's what happened in the past year. It was quite exciting. Yeah, so so you've come a long way. You've gone from that to leading this global movement that I'm proud to be one of the- I'm in this sweet spot now. So I went whee, all the that, way up. That is great. That is great, yeah. Harry. Uh, someone else, so one more example. Anyone have something, a specific skill that's a sweet spot for you that was a failure zone uh, at some point in your life? Yeah, Denise. Yeah. Um definitely um accepting and giving uh, criticism um and um and so i was i'm horrible at i was horrible at accepting it and horrible at giving it um and um and so um but through reading through reading you know stephen covey uh, seek to understand um living the platinum rule which is treat people as they want to be treated mm -hmm. uh the golden rule is people as you want to be treated and really educating myself i realized that when you get criticism it's an opportunity for growth and you really need to listen to what people are saying to you and and especially if it's from multiple sources and then the other thing is when you're giving criticism you're actually helping that person by um in delivering it in the right way but you're not doing any favors if someone's not performing and you're not sitting down with them and let you know you're just letting them fail as a leader yeah. so i learned that this is a huge leadership element and that became my sweet spot and i got promoted you know wow. because of it that's great thank you for sharing that denise so this question i just posed um, it's kind of a trick question because everything that you're good at, anything that you have in your sweet spot, you started, maybe you weren't a failure, but you probably weren't born that way. If you're a good writer, presenter, whatever you are, whatever you put in your, I'm good at this box, look at it and say, was I as good as I, as I am now when 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago? Probably not. Very few people come out of the womb playing the guitar or, you know, as, you know, ready for the MBA, NBA or, right? Everything, everything we're good at, we've grown into. So it may not have been defined as a failure, but 
you definitely were not as good or as great as you were years ago as you are right now. And you probably gravitated from the failure zone through the growth zone into the sweet spot. For me, the example I always use is public speaking. I am, even though I talk loud and fast because I'm a New Yorker, I am an extreme introvert. Um, I always say I'm a three B's guy. I'm a back of the room, behind the scenes bookworm by nature. Um, that's who I am. Uh, everything I've done since then and I do today is just a result of, not just, but a result of pushing myself out of my comfort zone. So I would have said, I would have given myself, um, in terms of public speaking, I would say I was terrified of it and terrible at it for most of my like, life. I took a Dale Carnegie public speaking course um, at age, I won't say what age, late 30s, after 9-11. Um, I was out of work. I wasn't dating anyone. I was just in a rut. I took a Dale Carnegie public speaking course that, not to plug them, but it changed my life in terms of my confidence, my public speaking skills. I became a class coach. I became a trainer for them. And that launched my whole training speaking career. If I had not done that, um, I would not, anything that happened since then, I wouldn't have gotten my job at LiquidNet as head of leadership development. I wouldn't be teaching at NYU in Columbia. I wouldn't have done my TED talk, wouldn't have written my book. I wouldn't be with you today, right? So there was a, a lot of times we have um, things that happen in our life that we just evolve and we don't even notice it. And other times it's like a pivotal crucible moment. And when I signed up for that Dale Carnegie course, I went the first day and I hated it. I was there for the first hour and a half. And I was like, this is not for me. And then they said, everyone's going to have to speak after the break. And I was so terrified of that. I took my bag and my coat and I started to leave. I actually took the elevator down to the lobby. And then I decided to come back up and I was debating, they were just about to start. And I looked at that little cup porthole and I said, should I go back in or should I go home? And I'm like, if I go home, I'm just gonna go home and watch TV. I have nothing really to do tonight. I went back in and I have no idea what my life, it's like, it's a wonderful life. I don't know what would have happened if I had gone home that night, but most of the things I just described would not have happened most likely had I not gone back into that room. So that's an example of going from a failure zone. And was I good at public speaking? It took me a few years to be, competent and comfortable in front of the room. And now I, I don't even think about it. I do it all the time. I've done 60 podcast interviews over the last year. Um, I've spoken in front of huge groups. So again, anything that you're good at right now or anything in your growth zone that you would like to be good at probably started somewhere in that failure zone. And it's just about working at it, working at it, working towards it. Um, and that's what this is all about is getting better at things and recognizing that we were not born with any of these skills that we have today. So I just wanna give that example because um, that's my own personal example that, you know, again, brought me here today. So with that in mind, what I'd like you to do right now is take the list um, that you made, right, your passions and your skills. So here's my example of my scores. And then you're going to plug it in. Here's an example of mine. Um, and let me just show you. So for myself, um, the things in my sweet spot are Reading is at the top of my list. I love to read. I could read 20 hours a day if I was allowed to. I don't know if you've all seen the Twilight Zone episode called Time Enough at Last with Burgess Meredith, where all he wants to do is, he's a bank teller, all he wants to do is read. So he locks himself away in the vault. There's a nuclear war. Everyone in the world is wiped out. And it's, he's now has the, he comes out of the vault and all these books are piled up and he gets to spend the rest of his life reading. And he goes, bends down to pick up a book and his glasses break. So that's one of those Twilight Zone twists. Um, so that's why be careful what you wish for because you never know what might happen. But reading, teaching, coaching, designing programs, writing, and public speaking are now lumped together in my sweet spot. In my growth zone, things I'm actively working on is getting better at social media, using LinkedIn. I'd like to use video more. I should have put the word video, but that's one of my growth zone things is using video more to promote myself and to do LinkedIn Live. And even for like for myself, even though I'm comfortable as public speaking, I do not feel comfortable using video. Like the, I don't like the, like the people just take out their phone and go live on LinkedIn Live or Facebook Live. That's still outside of my comfort zone. I don't feel. I'm not ready yet, but I'm working on it. And there's other things related to social media and also marketing myself. Some ways I've gotten much better than I used to be, but that's still growth zone. Failure zone, my default zone is paperwork. I'm very good at it. I'm efficient and I have systems and processes. I just hate it. I just hate doing paperwork. And I'm doing my taxes right now for Big Blue Gumball and my personal, it's just, I hate anything related to having to fill out forms and things like that. And my failure zone is, you know, sales. I am not a salesperson. All of my business comes through word of mouth and referrals. But if I had to pick up the phone and call someone or email someone, um, I would say, you don't want any training programs, do you? Okay, I don't think so, thanks. And like that's, so I could definitely use some sales training. 
I see some smiles there. I don't know if you've done that or you know, uh, have some advice for me. Doing proposals, I hate doing it. I'm not great at it. Negotiating, not a skill. Financial stuff and technology stuff is at the very bottom. I try to delegate those things or outsource those things. So this is mine as an example. So what I'd like you to do right now is take your list that you put together. You can have a chance to share it with someone else, but create your own version of this. And this is gonna take a good, let's give you like, I'm gonna put three minutes on the clock. If you need more time, I'll give you an extra minute or two, but let's take three minutes of silence just to create now your own passion skill matrix, but you have a running start from the, uh, the list that you just put together. So with that three minutes starting now. And Sylvia, welcome. I just saw you pop in. Nice to meet you. Okay, take uh, about 45 more seconds. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do right now is um, I'm going to put you in breakout rooms, groups of either three or four. And for about, let me see, it's 7.03. So let's say um, around seven minutes and just 
share whatever you're willing to share. This is, I know it's a very private, personal thing, so you only have to share what you're willing to share, but just think about right now, before you go into the breakout room, what's an aha, a takeaway? I always talk, here's a better way. I always talk about insights, actions, and outcomes. What's an insight you have, looking at your passion skill matrix right now as a snapshot in time, what's an aha you had? What's one realization that you hadn't thought about before or something you just noticed? What's one thing you're gonna, an action, what's you, what are you gonna do now as a result? What, what change might you make or adjustments or whatever? And an outcome, you don't have to share this, but what if you do that based on this insight and making this change, what would the result be? What would change? What would be better? What would, how would your life or your work uh, be better? So um, with that, I'm gonna put you in the rooms, uh, check back uh, in about, and then we'll talk about it as a full group. I think around seven minutes is a good length of time just to, to uh, to share um, your thoughts. So with that, I'm gonna open all rooms and I'll see you, I'll come get you in around seven minutes or so. Yasmin, are you in the room? Yasmin, are you in the room? I don't see you on the list for some reason. I'm not, but I'm, I'm okay. Okay. I am just seeing here the list. I think it's because we are both hosts. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we have rooms of three, 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 four, and four. So, all right, that's fine. Yeah. How do you think it's going so far? So good, it's very yeah. hands-on. Okay, great, great. I had so many aha moments. Oh yeah. <laughs> Such as? Um, so everyone tells me that I'm very organized and, and like, uh, but I never really liked organizing. It was just um, because uh, one, I've been uh, in contact with people that are very organized and I've seen them being able to do more. So I was like, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not because I was born organized. It was just because I want, I want to do so much that if it's a way for me to yeah. get to the goal, it's mm -hmm. not, for example, I love mentorship. I love mentorship. So I kind of like, I was born loving mentorship, right? It's different than organizing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. It's, again, at different part, points of our career, sometimes we have to do certain things just to get our foot in the door or as a transition. Yeah. Like I said, I was a project manager for many years and I, I was good at it, I didn't love it, but now I really, that's just not something I wanna do at this point. I wanna be more strategic and more um, more dealing with, you know. but it, again, there's always parts of our job that we don't love, but that's the main thing, as long as there are other parts that we do and then you evolve over time and you delegate certain things to other people and that frees you up to do more of what you, you know, you can focus on your sweet spot. Yes. How many people have the courage to to do that, to give up on a job you're good at just mm -hmm. because you don't love? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to be able to, the courage, but also you have to be able to afford it, right? But I know of people course. who had jobs that were secure and stable and they just hated their job or hated their boss and they just said, you know what, I'm either burnt out or unhappy or I just need a yeah. change. And what's interesting, I think the pandemic has forced a lot of people to reevaluate their values, what's important to them where yeah. they want to be spending their time. So it's, uh, I think it's really shaking a lot of things up. So I know a number of people, a few people have said to me, I will never go back to an office again. I'll quit my, if my, uh, if my company forces me to come back to an office, um, I'll quit and I'll find another job. So I, a number of people have said that to me. Yeah, and, and honestly, I, I, I am not surprised because um, even myself, like, I, I start questioning my my decision of leaving abroad because like you really start seeing like is it worthy because like I'm working from home I could be close to my family 
Mm -hmm. uh, you really start like seeing that, well, maybe if, if I can get the most out of the experience of being abroad, I might as well just be beside my family. Yeah. Right. It's, it's just a reevaluation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. These are all choices that we're going to have to make. So. Yeah. All right. So I'll give so about two more minutes and then uh, I'll give them one minute notice. A very nice group of people we have. Yeah, very nice. It's great. Only a couple, I think there's only like one person who doesn't have his camera on, but everyone else has been very active and engaged. So that's been great. Very nice group, like different ages and different backgrounds. And yeah. and different parts of the world. I mean, people are dialing in, it's midnight and or yeah. later in, in Europe and, uh, and Will getting up early. So, although he's always up, I think this early, so for him. Yeah. Send them a note saying there's two minutes left. It's good that today I stayed and Max went because normally I am the one that do the exercise in the events and she always stays. <laughs> today we switch <laughs> so she can have some fun. Yeah, a lot of times when you're doing things, you don't get to be the participant or you don't get to uh, experience it. So it's good to experience it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And we could, we could, we should probably, after we're done, we, you know, if we could stay after a few minutes just to debrief and see what we thought and everything, that would be helpful. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like this, this uh, survey in a QR code, they're going to complete during the event. So like I can send right away for you the Google Drive um and yeah okay great Okay, just close the rooms. They'll be back in a minute. Oh, come back. Welcome back. Hopefully everyone had a good conversation. We'll just wait till everyone else returns. Margo, where are you based? I forget. Vancouver. Vancouver, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so everyone's back. Welcome back. So let's just take a few minutes to debrief. What was that like? Either what you learned, what you pick up, really anything you want to talk about. So let's just share some, some thoughts. So who wants to kick us off?
I Give think God, I'll, I'll start. Um, one of the big things I think we, a lot of us have in common, and it, it's always difficult to say out loud, is we're thriving during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, you know, one of the things that happened was we got to do more of our sweet spot um, and, uh, and spent more time in my sweet spot. So I would say pre-pandemic, I literally maybe was in 20% for my sweet spot. I'm at 70% right now. Mm -hmm. And then another 20% in my growth and 5% in default and 5% in failure, because you can just choose. There's just so much more opportunity to choose your um, day every day and more flexibility working remotely and, and engaging with people virtually and doing things differently um, and, and removing um, um, energy vampires is a lot easier uh, from a remote situation than it is being in the office and having them fly around you. So, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I, I do think the pandemic sometimes helps. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, I mean, think about how much our lives have changed in the last year. Um, and would you have had a different passion skill matrix, you know, you, you know, 13 months ago, right, than, than you do right now. Uh, Yasmin and I was just talking, it's like, I know people who um, are have jobs that are in the default zone and they're like when this pandemic is over that's it this made me realize I need to make a career change so just so come you know after fall after Labor Day it's gonna be really interesting after people have their shots and after the summer's over this huge shakeup that could happen I know a few people who said I will never work in an office again I've shown I can work from home I prefer it I hate commuting I I, I can say four hours a day. I want to be, you know, near your, you know, your kids or whatever. Um, so it'd be interesting to see, you know, what, and, and the passion matrix definitely, passion skill matrix definitely factors into those decisions that we make. And people say, I want to pursue my passion. Well, you just have a realization that life is shorter than you thought. And now is the time to make that switch. So it's a really impacted a lot of people in terms of how they picture what they, you know, people who are spending a lot of their time below the line have realized, and a lot of times that people have that aha after doing the passion skill matrix, that they're spending a lot of their time in the default and failure zone, and they really want to spend more time above that line in the growth and, and sweet spot. So who else? Someone else give us an insight. I'll, sh I'll share something, um, uh, Todd. I, I realized that I don't like sales, but I actually love marketing. And so we were talking about what's the difference. And uh, probably uh, the thing that I don't like about sales is the feeling of having to pressure somebody to make a decision whether it is in their benefit or not mm. and, and trying to close. I don't really like the closing aspect, but I do like providing opportunities and and uh, options and uh, engaging. And uh, of course you love it when they do buy, but uh, I don't like uh, sales and I do love marketing. That was an interesting insight. That's great, thank you. Yeah, a lot of times people lump sales and marketing together, but they're very different. Like same thing for me. That's why I have marketing in my growth zone, but sales still in my failure zone because they're different, they're different tasks associated with each, right? Yeah. I, I have to I have to unmike for a second because I do both and I, I I'd argue that point with you and I will argue with you separately, Todd. Okay. <laughs> There's not. So what's, this, what's, this your, what's your what's your let's not argue, but uh, yeah, what's your take, Joanne? No, I, I I don't I you market to sell. That's what you do. So mm -hmm. it's just it's switching. I'm actually working on. It's one of the things that I haven't been paying enough attention to. Working on a audio course that'll be how to sell when you don't feel like selling, mm -hmm. um, and just kind of trying to switch the whole. The whole paradigm around it because it's exactly will what will said he people feel like they're pushing but if you do it right it really is and it's just another version of telling a story yeah i agree i agree with I, you. I, I can't keep my mouth shut I'm no that's good. no I, we don't want you to Sorry. that's what we're that's what we're here for otherwise <laughs> i would have muted you um but yeah i think a lot of it has to do with our we need to reframe it right yes, i think a lot exactly. of times when we i hear the word sales i had a summer job when I was in college where I had a, I sold va vacuum cleaners, literally door to door. The company would send me out to really poor neighborhoods with these $500 vacuum cleaners. And I had a, I really felt like I was tricking people or, or manipulating people. So if you associate with sales, with sleaziness, used car sales, but like if that's your mind, if that's your mind, I think a big part of it, and what you can help with Joanne is that reframing, right? Reframing yeah. that in a more positive way. So, cause that's not what it really is, right? So- Yes, and when I'm done it, I will let you know and let everyone here know, so. <laughs> I, will look, I will look forward to that. Thank you, Jane. So what For else? Me, I have some struggles. I have some struggles with, with the sales and marketing just quickly on that. Um, and it's like promote, it's sort of um, promoting something you don't believe in or you're not passionate about. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, you know, yeah. I'm good. I can Perhaps. be good at it, but it's sort of soul destroying. Yeah. 
I think it's also like if you're consultative selling, right? If you realize you're, you're offering something to someone that will help them, it's again, that's a reframing of sales as opposed to manipulating mm -hmm. or tricking someone into doing something that's not to their benefit, right? And I think that's a big part of the reframing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, someone else, someone else. What's an aha you had or an action you're gonna take or something you hadn't thought about before? I'll, I'll share one insight that I didn't have from last time. Um, I, had I had asked the, um, the members in my room what percent they wanna spend in the sweet spot and the growth zone. And I wonder if those shift over time because my growth zone percentage is actually higher than my sweet spot. But my other two were, were the opposite. And maybe it's like has to do with like how far along you are in your career. Like right now, I just want to like grow. But like later, I might want to like have more sweet spot because growth is like really energy intensive. Um, so I just thought that that range being flexible with that range was an interesting thought. Yeah. And again, this is something that is fluid. It's going to move around all, like Maxine said, sometimes it's different parts of our career, times of the year. I mean, a lot of things could shift. Sometimes I'll do this exercise in person where each person will write each thing on a post-it and we'll put them up on the wall and then you move the post-its around, right? So then you could kind of, oh, you know, reshift. I'll talk more about that later. But yeah, this is a constantly fluid thing. But um, yeah, a lot of it has to do with our mindset and what's going on in our lives and where we can. Do you have the luxury to spend that time in the growth zone? A lot of times people are just, um, you know, living in the default zone just for the paycheck for right now until they can, you know, find the time to fulfill their, their passions, right? Um, what else? Let's get a few more. Just basing it off what Max just said, I mean, I think I, I was the opposite in terms of growth versus a sweet spot of like, it's like, oh, I don't have a, a ton of things in my growth zone right now. I am improving, but a lot of the things I'm working on growing in are stuff that I already feel I'm good at. Um, and just kind of, just kind of like having to think about that and being like, oh yeah, like maybe I need to shift uh, some of my attention to to like focus on growing in some things that I'm not good at because like that's uncomfortable and I'm probably not doing it enough. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you, Brett. That's a great insight. Uh, Denise, you typed something really long that I, I can't read right now, but uh, is there something that you can you share that quickly? Uh, sure. It was about sales versus marketing. I had a business development team and we were tasked with a really aggressive goal. And one of the guys on my team, um, every time he'd have to do a cold call, he would literally physically throw up and he was losing so much weight. He came to me and said, you know, this is just not working out for me. So we used the books worth your strengths and it's, he scored really high in marketing. He never even knew about marketing or anything. So I called the marketing department and they interviewed him and they took him and he's now, his career's rocketed and he's now um, in, a, in a, a VP level in a fortune 500 company in marketing. So it's a great, it's a great success story of finding what you love. And, and what you're great that, at. And that, yeah, that sounds like a failure zone to sweet spot, to growth zone to sweet spot type of example. Great, thank you. Someone else, let's get a couple more. Either insights you had or actions you're gonna take. I think I'm just gonna add Todd. I think I'm gonna add this exercise on a quarterly basis or a monthly basis into um, doing it for myself and, and redefining um, a, a little bit more of what are my passions and what, I, you know, some areas I have so many ideas and other areas I don't and I can't name those skills and really like looking at those two category skills and passions through this lens. Yeah. Um, so that, that's just a takeaway. Yeah, that's a great exercise to do. And again, I use this, you know, if you're, if you do any coaching or teaching, or if you, you can use this with your kids, you could use this with, um, so I, uh, I know a few people have used this during like, um, during our interview process to find out what a candidate's skills and passions are, right? So there's a lot of different ways. Let me just give you a couple of examples of um, how this could be used in addition to how we just used it now. So um, to use it, with yourself is one thing to use it with a team. So when I do team building offsites, I will have people do the similar exercise. We'll create one master chart. And again, you need to create a climate of psychological safety and vulnerability where everyone can be honest and candid. Um, otherwise this doesn't work. But if you take everyone's list of here's you, here's each of the person on your on people on your team, have everyone list their what they're good at, like doing, not good and don't like doing. Each person creates their passion skill matrix just as you just did. And then we put them all up on the wall Right. This is an example. Yeah. You know, this is just a, a visual 
uh, power of visual thinking, right? This is a visualization of what it would look like if we took everyone's and put them up on the wall. Let's say if we were a team right here, right? Then what we did is everyone got a different colored marker and we created a team. This was the size of a wall. So this is, you can't tell how big this was, but each person got a different colored marker. So they basically lifted what they wrote on their sheets onto this master chart. And then, well, let me ask you, what do you think came of this? This was done with a, this was done with a, um, at a pharma company um, with a few different divisions. Um, this was about 24 people who filled this out and, and, and did this. So you can see some of the, you know, listening uh, presentation skills are in a few spots. Um, what do you think we did with this after capturing this? Yeah, just Justine. Um, maybe matched people up for like mentoring and mentees. Yeah, so that's a great example. So we had some people who, first of all, what happened was a lot of the conversations were like people said things like, you think you're bad at that? I think you're amazing at it. Or I didn't, you're so great at this. Why do you hate it so much? You said you hate it, right? So all of a sudden it triggered all these conversations and then building on what Justine just suggested, what we did, we found some people who had things in their growth zone where someone else had that in the default zone and said, can we mentor this person? Can we give them the training and coaching they need to take some of these tasks off this person's hands this person was responsible for mentoring them. The what's in it for me for the mentor was the quicker you got that person up to speed, the quicker you got that off your plate, right? And as soon as you were able to hand over some of those tasks to someone else, that freed you up to spend more of your time in your growth zone and in your sweet spot. So they basically took this and redefined roles and responsibilities for everyone in the department to try to get people to spend as much time as possible above that line. Now we couldn't get everyone, there's sometimes someone was the only one who could do something um but then there was no succession planning because what if that person left right that's one of the things that they had the department realized that we're so reliant on this person who does this thing in his or her default zone that if they quit because they hate their job so much and they're disengaged they can leave us with a huge hole and we have no one to, so even then this person said even though we don't have anyone to fill that spot right now we need to get moving on that right so this was a great real life example of how this company uh, this department basically reconfigured what everyone did and their engagement scores skyrocketed. First of all, the fact that everyone was just asked, what do you like to do and what, what are you good at? Um, sometimes people just like to be heard and, and given a voice and be able to express that. But when companies act on it and say, let's see if we can take some of that stuff off your plate. Also, some people had things in their failure zone because they didn't have the training or coaching they needed to be skilled at it. Once they it's like, if you hate doing something, is it because you don't like it or do you not like it because you're not good at it? Once someone got the training and coaching and developed their skills, they learned to like it, they worked harder at it, and then we found things that bumped their way up, inched their way up from the failure zone to the growth zone, and we're heading towards the sweet spot. So again, this is a tool that could really make get people to rethink everything. And again, uh, one of the biggest areas was public speaking. So many people were th are thrown into being public speakers without any training, any coaching. And with the practice, they got better. And I tell this to my students all the time. The more you practice, the better you get. The more better you get, the more confident you get. The more confident you get, the more willing you are to take risks and push yourself out of your comfort zone. And that wheel turns. And that's how you turn a failure zone into a growth zone and ultimately into a sweet spot. So again, uh, one thing to keep in mind, last thing on this before we start to wrap things up, is you can have something in a sweet spot, but if you don't keep your interests and passions and skills up, it could easily drop into the default zone and you find yourself over time in the failure zone, right? If you just dial it in and you just become complacent. So this is a constantly, it's almost like a cycle. It's like a loop, right? So you want to be thinking about all of these things as you go along. So ideally in the real world, we'd like to spend as much possible uh, time as possible above the line in our sweet spot and growth zone. Um, Frederick Taylor said way back in 1911 that people do best what they like best to do. So as managers and leaders, we want to set our people up for success, uh, find out what they like, have them fill out a passion skill matrix, talk to them about it. It's a great conversation starter and it gets, it's a great way for someone to download this out of the head and onto paper so that you can have a conversation. It can even be used as a 360. Imagine if a manager filled out a passion skill matrix on their people and then you compared notes and to see how accurate you are in terms of um, you know, knowing what people are good at or think they're good at and what they like to do. So there's a lot of different ways to use this tool. And you now have this new tool in your professional development toolbox. So with that, just as a reminder uh, for the chapter, just go to 
toddchurchless.com slash passion to download the chapter for free. Um, if you want a refresher on this, NYU was um, did a two minute video of me talking about the passion skill matrix. This will be in the PowerPoint. You just click on it and you'll be able to see the visual. Uh, they added graphics to it, which is really cool. Um, and uh, any questions, um, we'll stay after for a couple of minutes. I just want to wrap things up so we can, so people who need to leave right on the half hour can. So any questions, we'll take them in just a minute. Um, but the question I want to ask you is what was your biggest takeaway from today? Um, and what's something that you're going to do differently as a result using the passion skill matrix? So if you could, um, we don't have time to go around the room, but if you could type it in the chat box, that would be really great feedback for me and for us just to know what's something what resonated with you or what are you going to do? Um, and anyone who wants, feel free to save the chat box if you want to see the notes afterwards. So uh, I look forward to uh, capturing that. So after everyone types them in, we'll wrap up and yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Yasmin and then uh, we'll close things out in just a minute. Thank you. Just give us one minute, just one minute before you close. Just if everyone could just type your key takeaway into the chat box, just take 30 seconds right now. And also, uh, I think most of you here are linked in with me, but if you're not, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Also check out my, um, my uh, profile on uh, Pick My Brain. Um, and feel free to reach out to Pick My Brain anytime. And uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Yasmin to close us out. Thank you so much, Todd. On behalf of the whole Pick My Brain team, uh, it was amazing. Thank you so much. I hope you all like it as much as I did. Uh, for us to report back to Todd, I would invite you to take out your phones right now and open your camera and point to the QR code on the screen. It's going to pop up something, and there's three questions for you to fill it out um, for us to send it back to Todd. I will also be sending an email with um, the material that he mentioned and also Todd's link on Pick My Brain. Um, so that you can um, go there and check his availability to connect in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, and also be part of our platform, our knowledge sharing platform. Thank you, Yasmin, and thank you, Maxine, for having me. And uh, as soon as everyone's done, uh, we'll just close it out and, and say our goodbyes. And if anyone wants to stay after for a couple of minutes with any other questions or thoughts, happy to do that. If Thank anyone you. wants to unmic and just applause, because I know it's like, it's just, we just don't get to do that anymore. <laughs> and like when someone gets to express what they know so well, right, to all of us collectively, I was saying in my room, we're all going to have this now as a reference point. We can all communicate now further because of Todd. So I'm super grateful. And again, yeah, Pick My Brain is looking to, again, if you have a class like Todd within you and you feel like you want to um, teach our community or your community, get in touch. And Todd, I, my follow-up is like, when's the next session? I'm That flew by. I was in flow. I want more. <laughs> we'll talk about that. I'm, I'm more than happy to. So we'll talk yeah, about that. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to start drawing from our brains more and more now that we have a surplus or a supply of brains and just ask them to teach right classes that they're the most passionate for. So keep an eye out um, if you enjoyed coming to class today <laughs> with us all. Yeah. Great, thank you. Anyone, anyone final comments before we, we, before we leave? Any comments, questions, thoughts? Yeah, Todd, you, you mentioned at the very beginning, uh, visual images, mental models, metaphors, and storytelling uh, as an approach to visual teaching or thinking. And mm -hmm. that's so intriguing. And I, I, I'm sure it's mostly covered in your book, but um, in terms of teaching with visual um, uh, thinking, what do you think is the most effective? Or do you all, a combination of all of those? Yeah, it really is a combination of all four of them. I use them all the time in all my classes, all my workshops. So for example, when I'm teaching the passion skill matrix with my students, I have them do exactly what you did tonight. They literally take out a pen and draw it and fill it out. So the act of, it uses both sides of your brain. Um, the act of drawing is kinesthetic. You're involved, you're engaged. Too many professors just stand up there and lecture and read off slides. Tonight was actually a good example of what I do in my classes. This is what my slides look like. These are the types of activities I do with my students. So um, that's mm -hmm. what I would say is incorporate not any, not one, but all four of those 
elements, use drawing. Um, my first article in Inc. Magazine came out a couple of months ago called, Can You Draw What Your Company Does? And I was just talking to Maxine about possibly doing a workshop around that. Because, um, and if you go just go to, if you just put in, can you draw what your company does in Google, you'll it'll bring you right to the article. It's a great exercise to get people to use drawing. It leverages another part of your brain to explain. Um, and I think it's a great sales tool as well. I think Joanne would agree with that, that if you can draw what your company does, then you can clearly articulate what your company does. And it's just another medium to use. Great, thank you. Thanks, thank you, Megan. That might be our next class, Todd. And like, can you draw what, or can someone draw what you do back yeah. that knows you? Like, what would yeah. they draw? Right back to that distortion of the mirror image. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. yeah. Todd, I want to thank you. I really enjoyed this. I would say the comments earlier about the sales versus marketing, mm -hmm. every one of us is in sales. Yeah. Whether or not we identify with that or agree to it, we are persuading. We are sharing with the intent to, to get people to look at another viewpoint. We may mm -hmm. be open as well. Uh, the question is, are we, is our bias such that we think of it in a negative way um, or as a way to help solve problems? So that's how I learned to look at sales and selling very differently. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah, Dan Pink's book, To Sell as Human, talks about that, right? It's just like, we are, like that's a great point. You're, oh, we're always trying to sell ourselves. And yeah, I think it's about reframing. And I think it's my own inner mental block, right? It's my own paradigm and I, that needs to change. And I think if I, if I could reframe what sales is, I would probably be better at it and more comfortable with it. So I think that's something, uh, maybe I'll, I'll bump the sales thing out of my failure zone and nudge it into the... Uh, into the into the growth zone and work on that over the next six months. I feel like though, Todd, it also has to do with uh, the culture you're working in. Mm -hmm. So uh, how sales is perceived, preceded, and and like how it's perceived, and also how the tasks oriented with what the end goals are. I mean, I was I I think. I'm good at sales, but then I went into a position and the expectations and the motivations, you know, were very traditional. It was, it was in other clothes. It looked like it was not going to be, you know, it was going to be long-term goals and it became very short term and it became much more traditional, but it was, um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't sold to me that way. <laughs> and so uh, it was rather deceptive. And, and, um, and so then I ended up not being very good at it. <laughs> and I used what I thought I was very good at to go in a perceived role that I thought would be easily transferable. And it was a failure zone immediately. Yeah. And I gutted it out for a year, but um, I'm still kerfluxed. Like, how did that happen? you know, kind of thing. But yeah, yeah that's all. I, I would say the culture has something to do with it too. Yeah. Well, well, Joanne's a master at this. So maybe she could do a pick my brain uh, yes. workshop on sale, reframing, Please. reframing okay. sales and marketing. Joanne. Maxine, Maxine's <laughs> ahead of you. She already, <laughs> we're already going to have a conversation. Right, so great. Great minds thinking alike. So there you go. <laughs> and Joanne has a great workbook that, uh, that you put out uh, last year, right? On, uh, on personal yeah, brand. How to, how to, Yes, how to get your personal brand stories straight. You can find it on Amazon. Yes. So another mm -hmm. thing we all have trouble with, because that's, again, kind of tying up with what Mason was saying. It's that's when you're, you're selling yourself. We're all selling ourselves. And certainly like people like myself and Todd, who are in business for ourselves, we're constantly selling ourselves. Yeah. Todd does a much better job at it than he gives himself credit for. So. <laughs> yes, he does. And he's also doing a very good job with social media. That was my kudos to you. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Your colleague. <laughs> so I teach a social media. The reason I immediately. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm just going to say it's become, we almost need to be all re educated in it because the game has changed. So that is why I reached out immediately because I think all of us need to put some time and energy and effort into figuring out how to express what it is and how we can be of service to the most amount of people and unashamedly to do it. So, yeah, help us. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> We'll be on it. Any other thoughts, comments before we, we close up shop? Thank you to those of us who stayed up late or got up early. Um, Perry, I know it's past your bedtime. So uh, <laughs> I, I just I just want to say when I read the book, it was, I was in a different space than I am now. And when I did this before and then now after a good um, deep into the pandemic and hopefully coming out, um, I think uh, 
I had a much better time, but much more fun this time. Cause like I said, I'm living in my sweet spot and I wasn't when I first started reading this book. So you really helped me get here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's such a good comment. I was always saying like, I hope books, like if anyone out here has written a book, I'm like, let's make it interactive. Let's go through each chapter and bring people together and go through it. Like I want 3D books now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of my plans. Each chapter of my book could be its own workshop. So that's something that uh, this was just a pilot and uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes from here. I can't wait. <laughs> All right, great. Well, nice to see everyone. Thank you for being here and uh, until next time. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Thank you so much. Uh, it's fabulous. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, Next Todd. Time. Thank you so much. Bye, Fantastic. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye. Hope to stay in touch. Bye bye.